Walking Phoenix, skinny, skinny, laughs a lot, but still so scary. Dances on steps, full stompy, stompy, puts a pillow over crazy mommy. But the thing that this movie is really about is white male rage, white male rage, white male rage. Joker! Hello, my rural chums. Hey there, I'm Ace Ventura, but evil. Nah, Jim Carrey's Dr. Robotnik was more than that. In fact, I loved it. My only criticism is that he wasn't horny enough, but that's just kind of a me thing. Anyways, back in the 1990s, Dr. Robotnik was the techno-fascist villain in a goofy video game where a speedy blue hedgehog had to stop him from enslaving all life and destroying nature itself. That game was called Sonic Spinball, and it was the only Sonic game. Actually, there's like 60 or 70 of them. In all of his various iterations, Dr. Robotnik is a genius. In the film, he's unparalleled. He has four PhDs, he's a brilliant inventor, but he also has a lack of empathy. He's a bully, a tough guy, if you will. He's an overachiever in all of his endeavors, but you would never want to be around him. All he cares about is his work, and he treats human connection as insignificant. Like I said, not horny enough at all. I was spitting out formulas while you were still spitting up formula. I was breastfed, actually. Nice. Or maybe very horny and just generally able to repress it. I don't know! He embodies a lot of what's expected of men in America and a lot of the problems these expectations create. I'm actually kind of shocked that with how popular the new Sonic movie is, some dopey lib thought leader hasn't written an unbearable think piece about how Dr. Robotnik is the ultimate expression of white male rage. According to Urban Dictionary, white male rage is a specific madness that a pampered white male gets when he's finally denied his desires and is hit by reality, ultimately causing him to react violently, sometimes resulting in domestic terror and mass shootings. This kind of rage is usually motivated by race, gender, religion, and political issues. It happens frequently, but the media sweeps it under the rug. Here's a thought about that. Robotnik is a member of the Professional Managerial Class, or PMC. He's deep state, too. His resources are vast, and he isn't really subject to outside rules or influence. So... he's kind of different from the people I typically see get criticized for white male rage. They think that we'll just sit there and take it like good little boys. That we won't werewolf and go wild! You finished? You see... To the elite members of society, class position and state affiliation can justify a lot of things. Dr. Robotnik is successful and powerful. If his demeanor isn't considered justifiable, then we might have some serious questions about the entire structure. Actually, let's be real, that think piece probably hasn't been written because it's a fucking Sonic movie. But if we stop and think, it does bring us to a couple of interesting questions. Why is it that the vast majority of what's deemed notable as white male rage is coming from poor, working class, or even lower middle class people? And why is it that when the stars align and fiction that portrays class struggle gets produced for the mainstream, it's labeled dangerous or even misogynist? Let's talk about something else from the 1990s. The rock music. Black hole sun. In the 1970s, rock was working class music. So much of it was about being the underdog and not having stuff. In the 80s, it shifted to be about excess, glamorizing wealth, debauchery, and electronic drum sets. But in the 1990s, rock music was about depression, hopelessness, and deodorant. 
Where the previous two decades had been very much informed by class, wealth, and a longing for upward mobility, grunge and later new metal were about feelings. And everyone has feelings, except Pete Buttigieg. I think it's worth mentioning that I don't really think it's good or bad that 90s rock music was very much about individual people's feelings. I'm sure someone could easily make a case for or against it, but I'm noting this purely because I think it's a result, a mirror, a conduit for the depression more and more people feel all the time. Still. Now. Nirvana, Soundgarden, Stone Temple Pilots, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, they all wrote music I hold really dear. It accurately describes how I've personally felt a lot of my life. Hopeless. In 90s America, the supposed end of history where no major developments would ever happen again, where humanity had reached its purported zenith, something always felt desperately wrong, or perhaps inauthentic, like an act. The video for Soundgarden's Black Hole Sun expressed how I felt about the 1990s pretty much exactly. The thing is, it was simply an accurate observation rather than a systemic critique. But people knew something was wrong. They felt it, and that's why grunge became a thing. Though it was, and probably still is, an era where people are incentivized not to connect those feelings to anything but ourselves. When we heard these depressing songs, we were reminded of our own failures. It was validating in a way, but we were often validating bad opinions about ourselves. Out of that came anger, the likes of Korn, Slipknot, and even Limp Bizkit. But again, to feel depression without knowing the cause doesn't just become better when it changes to anger without knowing the cause. Robotnik probably wouldn't tell you this, but he's a lonely dude. In the film, he was an orphan, and it seems like it bugs him. I was breastfed, actually. Nice. Rub that in my orphan face. He repeatedly states that he can't rely on people and that machines are his ideal. But he had something all the white men who got popular singing about their feelings didn't have. A path. A trajectory. A goal. Meaning. A place. To belong. These are the things the grunge jockeys didn't have. If only there was a populist left movement that had been talking to young people without a path, white men and otherwise, who were feeling hopeless between the 1990s and now, providing some kind of analysis to fill in the holes and redirect them away from blaming themselves and other everyday people for the faults of the system. Perhaps we could have avoided some things. Gamergate is one of those things. There's a baseline of facts I'm gonna have to put out there before you're allowed to hate me for not essentializing people like everyone on the internet's supposed to. Gamergate was an angry internet mob that started when Iran Janji, or whatever, I don't really care if I'm mispronouncing his name, wrote what he called the Zoe Post, accusing his ex, Zoe Quinn, an independent game developer, of an unethical relationship with a games journalist in exchange for positive coverage. It's about ethics in games journalism, was a rallying cry, and in truth, yeah, it actually would have been pretty cool if games journalism got better. That's ultimately not what happened, though. It's still pretty bad. Still pretty much advertising rather than journalism. Organizing hostility against an individual person seemed like it was going to change those things at the time, though. The ensuing harassment campaign, first against Quinn, then others, was termed Gamergate, and resulted in many people, including myself and my partner, being doxxed, stalked, and threatened. It also single-handedly fixed video games. Man, they sure are better now than they were then, aren't they? Now, Gamergate had a few different kinds of followers. The ones who were absolutely obsessed with Zoe Quinn and the ones that were angry that feminists were apparently taking over their video games, making the titties smaller or whatever. Ultimately, the reactionary ideology that was mobilized during Gamergate was misogyny. Women were the majority of the targets and repeated calls for a full return to industry and artistic norms that would be silly to call anything but patriarchal were consistently made. But, and this is where you're gonna hate me, was it just misogyny? I kinda don't think so. You see, no one is born hating women. Misogyny comes from somewhere. So where is that? And also, why does it take root? We've already established that the 90s was a time when white men who were openly feeling depressed and angry were big shit. 
It became its own industry, where commodification of those feelings led to mass profits. There's a reason for that. In this society, feelings of alienation are plentiful and, frankly, justified. Feelings of anger and depression are plentiful and justified. People were, and still are, feeling these feelings pretty intensely. I'm in a glass case of emotion! Showing people they aren't alone, but discouraging the seeking of human connection in favor of consumption behaviors designed to be cathartic and addictive made bank on validation and didn't result in a revolution. An obvious big win for money-liking revolution haters. But besides music that validated these young men, what else was there? Well, the video game space was pretty much a boys club until pretty recently, and even so, that certainly hasn't completely changed. These companies were marketing to young men pretty much exclusively, and these young men were known to feel powerless and alone. The power fantasy of being a god or hero in a video game, revered by a virtual public ingratiated through pretend victory, was something that was pretty well complementary to the kinds of emotions that were becoming impossible to avoid at the so-called end of history. The lack of meaning, the atomization, the anger, the sadness, all of it. I get it. It makes sense to me. I felt it myself. At times, I still do. The neoliberal consumer market society we're born into ties our worth to our consumption. So what happens when the thing you consume to pretend life means something changes? I think the negative feelings this causes are mostly justifiable, just not because ladies are taking my video games. That's the real trick though, isn't it? I think we're pretty consistently presented with a facade and told that it's progress. And then we're presented with another facade telling us the first facade is a facade and that society used to be so much better. An example of the progress facade would be the man-spreading argument. Fuck the man-spreading argument. I hate that shit. It's hard to overstate the stark contrast between the structural disparities for women over racial lines, class lines, etc., and a personal grievance like manspreading that, let's go ahead and say it, isn't a problem with the vast majority of people. This might shock you just a bit, but most people actually do understand the concept of personal space. I think staunch advocacy against manspreading is a fetishization of feminism made to be mass-produced for consumption. It's a product, the commodification of social justice, reduced to individual grievance for people sitting at a suburban dinner table to fight over. The question of whether some stranger in a BuzzFeed video is an entitled asshole stands in for the collective fight against structural injustice, and the catharsis of being on the right side feels like an end to one's personal narrative, keeping those feelings from spilling beyond that suburban dinner table. I think seeing that shit blasted out over the web, TV, or whatever encourages an inaccurate view of feminism. And if all the air around you is polluted, can you just choose to breathe clean air instead? No, and the people telling you that you're bad for breathing dirty air always look like assholes. Hence the second facade, reaction. The people who own and control the information economy have created a situation where a certain number of people will very simply not be exposed to the actual substance of any kind of progressive politics. Instead, they'll be presented with manspreading and be told, these people are why you can't get ahead. All they care about is demeaning you and restricting you. What's ultimately created is a fight over which is better, the future or the past. And it's between people with similar, if not the same, class interests. I think that it is perfectly justifiable to feel alienated by that image of feminism. I know I am. Does that make misogyny also justifiable? Well, not really, no. But it does give us a path, a line of questioning, to figure out how someone goes from naive kid to fedora-wearing lady disliker. When the manspreading complainers start talking about how heaving ridiculous game titties are bad, it's kind of hard to take that seriously. First, heaving ridiculous game titties are good, actually. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Well, I like them at least. It would probably be better to call them neutral, but yeah. The thing that makes heaving ridiculous game titties bad is their context in modern capitalism, stripped of all human elements, commodified, and marketed to generate and maintain demand. 
This is extremely reductive, obviously, and requires justifying ideology. The ideas that make it feel okay. Second, issues of equality in any industry, including video games, exist as more than images which appear in an end-user product to be consumed. That's the very end of the pipeline, the result. And it's what remains at the end of a production process, which involves people, time, and labor. Also, everyone who isn't a dude and wants video gaming to include them is kind of similarly atomized, angry, and sad. It's just they're outside the gates rather than inside. The thing is, becoming the consumer demographic that is catered to will not solve any of this. There's tears to the gates, like in Attack on Titan. The people who own everything are behind another gate. Getting through that first gate just provides consumption as meaning, which ultimately keeps us from asking why there's another gate. Consumers are often the target of criticism, but if you ask me, it's the production side we should be analyzing and criticizing. You know, the people making decisions, giving orders, paying wages, the people behind the second gate. Speaking of gates, if we look at Gamergate that way, is it really that shocking any of it happened? When society is set up to produce either fake woke shit libs that only care about themselves or MAGA chuds who only care about themselves, when the win conditions for an argument are purely aesthetic, does it really blow anyone's mind that people are fighting over the image of the other side rather than the production process, the process which the actual decisions are being made in? There absolutely were gamer gators that thought they were crusading to end corruption in the video games industry and in games journalism. If you think no one thought that, you're wrong. It's just like the fact that tons of neoliberal market feminists really do want to abolish the systemic disparities of a patriarchal society. The thing is, we're all constantly misled about who the primary culprits are. We're talking about warring aesthetics, two different images, people who ultimately believe feminism is out to hurt them, and people who believe feminism is out to save them. Here's the thing, when the argument is about what's consumed, aesthetically soaking in, then we're not really talking about effect. We're talking about intent. However, in the grand scheme, these aren't different sides. The intent isn't equivalent, but the effect is the creation of consumer demographics, doubling down on consumption itself, making consumption decisions, as well as advocating others consume the same things they do. Neither of these ideologies pose any threat to a commodity mode of production. Quite the opposite. They justify it. So where do these justifying ideologies come from? The White Male Rage SNL song was about movies, but in truth, there's a lot of media over the last few decades that could be described in the way this song characterizes these films. The thing is, this description is shallow. The conclusion we reach in that mindset is that grunge and nu metal were obviously for white men. Video games are naturally for white men. Joker is unmistakably only for white men. And so is The Irishman, Fight Club, The Matrix, and so on, because they all feature white men, which means that only white men have the feelings depicted in these works, right? Well, no. In fact, it's super weird to me that people view art that is tapping into the human condition and the state of society as exclusive to the artist. Meaning I think anyone who thinks about the state of society for more than a few seconds should come to the conclusion that these feelings are hardly exclusive to white men, even if they're given an unfair number of projects by which to express it. You want to know what I believe is actually going on here? Movies, video games, and music are made with white men in mind as a consumer. Capital sees white men as the demographic which is easiest to market to, easiest to generate demand in, and most likely to have either disposable income for, or be willing to eat into their non-disposable income for, something entertainment related. And you want to know why white men are like that? It's because they are inundated with it, from birth. White boy babies aren't born addicted to League of Legends any more or less than they're born looking down on women, fetishizing their sweet fat titties. People are socialized, people learn, people take in what is around them. But where does this information come from? Well, who controls the media? Who owns it? Who controls history? Well, who prints the books? Who owns the means of production? Why are they reinforcing all these norms? Why are they perpetuating this mode? Is it because the easiest way to maintain power is to do so? Is it even on purpose? Perhaps the real question is, does the motive 
really even actually matter? I mean, we've established that your motive might actually be to improve the video games industry and still your ideology leads you to harass women as a means to accomplish that, so why does it matter if capitalists are genuine villains or wealthy fools? Remember earlier when I said if only there was a populist left movement that had been talking to young, young people, people without, without a path, path white, white men and otherwise, otherwise, who were feeling hopeless between the 1990s and now, providing some kind of analysis to fill in the holes and redirect them away from blaming themselves and other everyday people for the faults of the system? Well, there might not have been one then, and the slack might have been picked up by video games, atheists, and eventually Jordan Peterson, but hey, you know what? There is a populist left movement now! And you know what else? White male rage is a boogeyman, formed in the dark recesses of comfortable PMC liberals' minds to justify their position in a world that has treated them better than others. It's a combination of essentialism, trauma, and the need for someone to blame for the loss of civility. A grave national embarrassment. Someone lower on the totem pole and with no recourse, but that everyone is convinced has a position of privilege. Here's the thing. Working class and poor white men should be angry. But the left populism that's currently rising is a lot more diverse than these PMC libs will ever admit. I mean, you do know marginalized doesn't mean wealthy and powerful, right? Like. Some people definitely do use the term marginalized groups because they think it helps them win arguments, but outside dipshit lib circles, people generally say words because they have meaning. Still, if you ignore the diversity of the working class and characterize the anger as white male rage, you could group it in with the various media trends we've covered today and dismiss it along with them. The angry white music, the angry white gamers, and the angry white movies must be what's making people angry. White people, in fact, just white people. Never mind that art imitates life, never mind that it's all a mirror of society in some way, and never mind the rising dissatisfaction begging to be acknowledged. You can bet that the people who own the means to produce will fund artists to acknowledge it in the safest way they can. You wonder why it's white men leading in the movies? It's because people think Killmonger's core argument was right, and so the revolution has to be a black villain, or it might look a little too good. I know how colonizers think. So we're going to use their own strategy against them. We're going to send vibranium weapons out to our war dogs. They'll arm oppressed people all over the world. Try to imagine a pitch for a movie that unambiguously celebrates a black hero violently rebelling against the United States, not only getting picked up, but receiving major industry funding. Sounds about as likely as getting killed by a vending machine. Hell, Joker is a villain and a white. And it was given a tiny budget compared to every single other film in its genre. It did make a billion dollars, though, from an audience that a majority, 56% of, was not white. Its imagery is being used in anti-capitalist protests all over the world. Why? Because whatever gender or ethnicity you are, we're all getting pretty fed up with the established order. If being anti-establishment and appealing directly to the people, you, whoever you are, you're the people, if rallying the people instead of appeasing the elites Oh wow, can't see the script through those. If all that was white male rage, then... All movements are just white male rage. And they aren't. So maybe let's agree together, as a group, a batch, a block, or like a class, to be skeptical of the way capitalist media depicts people who are angry about the conditions in a current capitalist society. Treating the anger of everyday people like it's fake is elitism. The working class is diverse, and we're angry for a reason. Genuinely can't see. Hey, thanks for watching this nonsense. Hope you liked it. There is a button that you can click in if, in fact, you did like it. I'd like you to do that, it certainly helps me. Uh, also, helping me, uh, subscribing, that's a thing, that's a big help. Clicking subscribe and enabling all notifications. But the biggest help of all is, of course, becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Obviously, I thank everyone who has already done that, and for all of you who are considering it, big ups. Thanks for watching.